All right, welcome everybody. Uh, it's uh, two o'clock Eastern time, and so we're going to get started. Um, welcome to the webinar. Uh, thank you so much to, for joining us today. And first and foremost, we hope you and your family are all healthy during these difficult times. My name is Emily Knight. I am a manager with the Lundfest Ocean Program. For those of you that don't know LendFest, we are a grant-making program that funds ocean and coastal research projects and expert working groups to address needs facing decision makers and stakeholders. To learn more about our program, visit us at LendFestOcean.org, where you can also sign up for our newsletter and follow us at LendFestOcean on Twitter. In fact, we'll be live tweeting the webinar so you can engage on the hashtag uh, hashtag LOP webinar. We are excited to have joining us today Dr. Malin Pinsky, uh, Associate Professor at Rutgers University, Dr. Alexa Fredston, Postdoctoral Scholar at Rutgers University, and Mr. Brandon Muckley, a Fisheries Management Specialist with the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council. They will be discussing their project to develop models to forecast how distributions of four species along the U.S. East Coast will change over the next one to 10 year time scale. For us at LensFest, the need for this project or this science uh, first came about from conversations between managers and scientists. First at a workshop organized by COMPASS on climate change and fisheries back in May of 2018, and later through more individual conversations. I will let the researchers get into the specifics, but the core goal of the project is to test a class of models known as dynamic range models to see if this is even possible. If it is, our hope is that it's not only useful to managers on the East Coast, but the method can also be applied elsewhere. Finally, this webinar is what we like to call a launch webinar, which is one that happens closer to the beginning of the project so that we can promote transparency about what the researchers intend to do and invite you to engage with us at any point throughout. We'll have our emails up at the end. Uh, we're always happy for further conversation and feedback. And in that same vein, we will continue uh, to implement outreach to share progress of the project through a variety of avenues. At this point, TBD, but I've started with running, uh, creating a running distribution list for anyone interested. If you are not on that or unsure if you are, just send me a note. My email is on the slide. Second, we are recording this webinar and we will distribute the link broadly after once we get it up on our YouTube channel. A few webinar logistics. We have all attendees muted with so many people on the line that's to pre pre uh, prevent feedback or echoes. Uh, we will have time at the end for questions please use the Q&A panel to type and submit your question at any point during the webinar. We will keep track of the queue and I will read the questions aloud at the end for the research team to answer. Depending on how many questions there are, we may not get to them all, but we download all of the questions out of WebEx at the end so we will see everything. And again, we encourage folks to follow up. Um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Malin Pinsky. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Malin, and turn it over to you. Sounds great, Emily. Oops. Take one second. Did that share successfully, Emily? Yes, it did. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much, Emily, for that intro. And thanks everyone who's tuned in today. I know so much of our lives have gone online. I appreciate you taking some time to listen to another webinar. Um, we're really excited to be diving into this project with the Lenfest Ocean programs and uh, everyone else on this team. So as Emily said, I'm Malin Pinsky. I'm a 
an associate professor at Rutgers University. My background is in ecology and evolution, and especially understanding shifts in species distributions in the ocean. I'm joined by Dr. Alexa Fredston, who's a postdoc on the project. And after a brief overview of the project that I'll give, Alexa will explain in more detail some of the methods that we're planning to use. And then uh, the other principal investigator on this project is Brandon Muffley, um, who will give a perspective uh, for how this work fits into the Mid-Atlantic Mid Fishery Management Council's uh, work. So the, the background of this project really is the observation that I think many of us have, have come to that a wide range of species in the ocean are moving in some cases quite rapidly to new locations as the ocean climate changes. This is just one example showing in red uh, areas in the Northeast US uh, that had high biomass of black sea bass in the early 1970s. And then uh, more recently, black sea bass has actually expanded 500 kilometers farther north um, at a time that ocean temperatures have also been warming rapidly in this region. Based on a, a range of uh, species habitat models, we also expect that many of these shifts in habitat will continue uh, quite dramatically over the rest of this century. These red arrows around different parts of North America just give a sense for how much farther we expect habitat for many species to shift by the end of the century. In some cases, uh, up to a thousand kilometers or even a bit, a bit more. The other key point is that these changes in where marine species are found really have some profound implications for fisheries management. Um, from very basic questions like how we define the stocks that are being managed and where those stocks are found, to other questions like which stakeholders should be at the table when decisions are management decisions are being made, uh, spatial management uh, measures will be effective, whether they should be moved or adjusted as species distributions change, what kinds of in incidental catch occurs during fisheries operations, what kind of species are overlapping with fisheries, and then finally issues, uh, questions of allocations and which stakeholders um, get access to, to these fisheries as they move into new locations and potentially new stakeholders um, uh, are nearby. But there's really this mental mismatch in timescales uh, between the models that we typically use for understanding these shifts in species distributions, uh, especially in the context of climate change. You know, the, the figure I showed you earlier is for the end of the end of the century. You know, we're talking about multiple decades uh, and these kinds of timescales are very different than the timescales at which decisions are made in the fisheries management process, or it's sometimes quarter to quarter or, you know, one to a few years out. Um, thinking about these long term changes in species distributions really doesn't mesh very well with the fisheries management management process. And that mismatch became especially clear in 2018 with the the workshop that Emily mentioned that was hosted by Compass, where we had representatives from fishery management councils and commissions from across the country talking about climate change and this mismatch in timescales. Um, really, what it became clear that that was a, an impediment. And that really brings us to a actually a scientific issue, which is that the, the models we use for understanding where species are likely to be in the future. Uh, are really based on these statistical associations between, in many cases, species abundance or sometimes their presence and some aspect of the climate. Maybe that's temperature. You know, fish may be particularly abundant at intermediate temperature, less abundant at high temperatures, less abundant at, at low temperatures. And implicit in these traditional species distribution models is the assumption that species abundance and their distributions are in equilibrium with a changing environment. And yet, especially if we're interested in sh making short-term predictions, we know that fish grow, reproduce, and move relatively slowly. So if conditions 500 kilometers north are suitable next year, fish won't immediately be there. It will take them some time uh, until they uh, expand their distributions into those new areas. 
So what we're testing out is a new class of species distribution models called dynamic range models that actually very explicitly include these demographic processes of growth, reproduction, and movement. One of the other benefits of moving to this more process-based view of species distributions is that it's much more natural to consider fishing as well. And for the species, many of these species that we're interested in, we know that fishing is really fundamental impact on their, on their population dynamics. So dynamic range models provide a much more natural way to integrate fishing and climate considerations together. So the overarching goal of this project is to develop and test dynamic range models for near-term forecasts, which for the purposes of this project, we're defining as a one to 10 year time frame. And we're focused, uh, we're going to focus our efforts on four species in particular uh, that are in the Mid-Atlantic uh, Mid Bight, where the Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council um, really focuses its efforts as well. These are species that have been uh, identified in collaboration with Brandon Muffley, but also uh, we've discussed these last fall with the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council's Ecosystem and Ocean Planning Committee. We heard a wide range of suggestions from Spanish mackerel to cobia, highly migratory species, or menhaden. We also heard uh, concerns, especially around species like summer flounder and short fin squid, that there are quite a few ongoing research and management efforts focused on these species. And we need to make sure to integrate uh, our research findings with those ongoing efforts and not work at cross purposes. But we ultimately picked these four species for uh, scientific reasons. They represent a range of life history types from relatively fast species, fast growing species like squid, where we expect uh, that assumption of uh, being in equilibrium with their environment may actually be met. Um, it may be for something like squid, we don't need a complicated, more complicated dynamic range model. Um, to slower growing species like dogfish, as well as species that have shown past shifts in distribution like summer flounder, and species that the Council of Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council is interested in because they may move into the Mid-Atlantic bite in the future, like triggerfish. So the research that we're going to be undertaking over the next few years is organized around three main questions. First, can we forecast changes in species distributions? Are they more effective than traditional species distribution models? If we do have some forecasting over what time scales are they useful? You know, are they only useful over one to two years? Do they have skill all the way out to 10 years? Um, that's a key research question for understanding how to incorporate this information into the management process. And then finally, if we include information on the fishing pressure, both intensity and location, does that help us improve our forecasts of species distributions? The last point I, I wanna make before I turn it over to Alexa though, is that the, while the, the research is, is a key goal of, of what we're doing and testing these dynamic range model forecasts, we have two other key goals as well. One of which is to uh, develop the forecast system of using dynamic range models, fitting them to data and making the forecasts um, widely available as an open access system that anyone in the world would be able to pick up and use and apply far beyond Mid-Atlantic Bite, far beyond the four species that we'll be focused on for this particular research. The other key, the other key goal is learning how the forecasts can best be incorporated into management decisions. So assuming that these models do have some skill, this will be a new kind of information that hasn't previously been available in the management process. So we're embark embarking on a collaborative learning process with, it, with the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council and with stakeholders in the region to learn how to both how to most effectively provide information from these models, but also learning how to use information from these models or how this information could be used uh, in the management process. I want to turn it over to Alexa to explain in more detail why the methods that we'll be using over the next few years. Thanks, Malin. The first thing that we'll do in this project is to separate data into training and testing data, which should sound familiar to anyone who's embarked on this type of modeling endeavor 
The data that we're using in this project is from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration surveys where they go out and go fishing around US oceans and record what they cat what they caught in its abundance. So we'll take this data and split the early years into a training data set and later years into a testing data set. Our hope is to train the forecast model in the early years and then do a good job of reconstructing the later years, which we'll then be able to test because of course we know what actually happened. Uh, next slide. We certainly hope that our, oh, if you could go back one, we certainly hope that our model does a good job of reconstructing dynamics for the whole testing series, but it's possible that it will just generally overestimate or underestimate or do a good job for a few years and then decay in skill. Malin introduced the idea of bringing more process and mechanism into a range model. So our goal here is to make forecasts based on what at its core is really a population dynamic model. Our model has three life cycles, small juveniles, large juveniles, and adults. Each of those has a death rate, also a transition or growth rate between small and large juveniles and large juveniles to adults. And finally, there's a rate at which it's produced offspring, which is here labeled self-recruitment. In order to make this model spatial, this entire schematic is contained in what we call a patch. The diagram here is showing you what that would look like if the patch was defined as a one degree latitudinal band. And we have a number of adjacent patches going down the coastline. That's what allows us to actually model species moving around the study region, which is to say shifting their ranges. And these patches can exchange species individuals either via dispersal of small juveniles or migration of adults. There's one other thing that I wanna mention about the structure of this model, which is that these orange arrows, which are the uh, population parameters or demographic parameters are mostly constant, but some of them can change as a result of temperature. And that represents our best guess for how temperature actually affects the biology of marine species and might change their, in this case, growth or self-recruitment. The one, there's one other thing I wanna say about this model before we move on, which is that if we knew all of these orange arrows, all of the population parameters without error, including the functional relationship between growth or self-recruitment and temperature, then we could just simulate the future and make a forecast based on this process-based model structure. But in the oceans, we very rarely know these parameters. They're very hard to estimate. And because we wanted to develop a modeling framework that was applicable to a lot of scenarios, not just our four focal species, in this model, we're actually estimating all of these parameters. So the first step of the model takes the survey data that I told you about from NOAA, which is data on occurrence and abundance, and fits a model using proximate Bayesian computation, which I'll explain in a second, to estimate these parameters. So part of our goal was to ensure that you don't need extensive experimental or field sampling on population parameters. We actually estimate them as part of the model process. So here's how that works in practice. The first step of approximate Bayesian computation is to specify a prior distribution for each of these parameters. Parameters you can think of as the orange arrows, again, growth, reproduction, and so on. And in the schematic, we're saying this is an uninformative prior. We're not giving any of these values much more weight than the others because we don't know which are more likely to be good or be true. So then we'll make a draw from each of these prior distributions for each parameter, and then we'll put those into our model, the process-based model that I just showed you a schematic of. From that process-based model, we can actually make that estimates for each patch and each year, how many small juveniles, large juveniles, and adults we expect to find, based again on these rates of growth, 
death and so on that we pulled out of the prior distributions. But if you recall, we have our training data in hand, and we actually know how many adults and so on were at all these patches in these years. And so we can compare the simulations to reality. We're going to do this a lot of times, something like 20,000 times or far more, and we'll throw out all the simulations that do a poor job of approximating the training data. That's going to leave us with a short list of the best simulations, but matching those simulations is the original draw from the prior. And that's what we're really interested in. What we're trying to get at is which value of each parameter produced the scenario that was closest to reality. Finally, for each of these parameters, we'll pool those prior draws, and not just by averaging them together, but actually by weighting them so that the ones that did the best job of matching the observations get the highest weight. That gives us a posterior distribution for each parameter, and that's how we start with only the range data and end up with these parameters that we need for process-based modeling. That brings us to the second half of the framework, which is the simulation. So having fitted this model to the training data, we will then make a forecast of the testing data years. Once again, this will give us occurrence in abundance, so we'll get back out of this, the range dynamics over time, which is what we're really interested in predicting, and we can compare it to what actually happened in the real data. I'm going to show you what that might look like based on work done in the Kinsky lab by a former postdoc, Jude Kong, and colleagues. Jude is now faculty at York University. And these graphs are using simulated data, so they're not using the actual trawl data. This was to test the structure of the model, so we certainly hope ours look this great when we eventually can generate them. But what you're looking at here is the data created for testing, which is the black line, and the model simulation after it was trained on that data, which is the red line. You can see here for this patch and this age class, which is the small juveniles, that the model does a very good job of reconstructing those dynamics. And actually, that's what we find here for all of the patches and size classes that do testing. So we're doing these kinds of comparisons with the model to evaluate how well our forecast is doing at different time scales, as Malin said. Additionally, we'll be comparing the performance of our model to traditional species distribution models, a persistence forecast, and other ways to evaluate how well these forecasts really are performing at short time scales. I'm gonna pause there and turn things over to Brandon Muffley to talk about management. Great, thanks Alexa, I appreciate it. Um, I have a, a few slides that I'm gonna go through in terms of highlighting why the Mid-Atlantic Council is interested in, in this area of research and science and how the, the council has utilized some of the earlier climate velocity and species distribution shift work that Malin talked about previously. And, and I'll follow up with some potential applications and area of interest from the Mid-Atlantic Council and beyond in terms of how this project may help inform future management work. And so the, the council really got interested in this sort of work, you know, several years ago, and it really started with fishermen, really beginning to see changes take place on the water, seeing different species show up, uh, their target species showing up in different locations, and then needing to travel to different areas to go harvest uh, their target species. And, and at the same time, stakeholders were really more broadly beginning to encourage the council to take a more comprehensive look at ecosystem issues within their management process. And so all of that uh, sort of led the council to develop its EAFM guidance document, um, which was approved in 2016. And this created this non-regulatory umbrella across all of the council's science and management um, activities. And it's the way, you know, a way in which the council can begin to bring ecosystem considerations within to their management framework. They're going to continue to manage species on a single species basis, but there are ways to bring in ecosystem issues, socioeconomic factors, and these distribution shifts within to their management, fr the current management framework. 
Next slide. And so the EAFM guidance document is, is broken into four, four areas covering forage, habitat, climate change and variability, and, and interactions. And this area, species distributions um, and climate, you know, climate change fits into that climate change and variability section. I will add, I have, you know, socioeconomic sort of permeates all four of these uh, different chapters and how each of those areas may impact socioeconomic issues within the mid-Atlantic mid region. So again, I'm going to focus in on this climate change and variability chapter, um, which addresses uh, distribution shifts, which is the focus of the discussion in this research. And actually, Malin was one of many scientists that helped develop and provide information on the science capabilities and needs within this section of the, of the guidance document. So next slide. And so one of the areas of, of research that was available at the time when the council was developing the, the guidance document was the climate vulnerability assessment that was conducted by John Hare et al. back in 2016. And this showed that looking at mid-Atlantic species, um, it, it evaluated the directional effect of climate change and the potential for distribution change of mid-Atlantic species. And generally, there was a mix, um, you know, a mixed results across species in terms of whether or not the you know, changes from climate and distribution were going to have positive, neutral, or negative impacts on different mid-Atlantic council species. But species distributions from many mid-Atlantic species were going to be highly or, or very highly impacted over, over time. And three, the three mid-Atlantic species considered in this project are in the very high to high potential to change over time. Next slide. And clearly, all of these issues with species moving around um, not only leads to a variety of biological implications, such as productivity and changes in species interactions, they also create management complications. The species generally don't adhere to polit political boundaries, and as they're beginning to shift um, from their historical locations to new locations, it creates even greater complications. And fortunately or unfortunately, I guess the Atlantic coast is one of the most comp has one of the most complicated management systems uh, in the country. It has three separate management councils. Um, it also has the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission for management over state waters. And then we have 15 Atlantic coastal states, each with their own regulatory and permitting complexities. So when you add all of these things together and you have um, stocks on the move, it creates a, a real uh, government and management um, sort of complexity that's difficult to deal with. So the EAFM guidance document was really structured to help address lots of these different areas. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, it's on the species distribution shifts. What you want? Uh, you're, you're on the right line. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Um, so as I had mentioned, the, the council had collaborated with, with Jim Morley and Malin was on this team as well that was looking at, you know, these climate velocities and projecting species distribution shifts into the 21st century. And that information was talked about within our guidance document and that that research was really informative and was considered, you know, quite heavily by the council, but it was really considered in a strategic way in terms of thinking about sort of long term, um, you know, activities and actions that the council may want to be thinking about more long term, such as the development of the EAF and guidance document. Where this project allows the council to think about distribution change, change in a much more tactical way thinking about how species may be shifting within this shorter time frame, which is much more on the scale of council actions and actually the, the duration of time that a council member may, may serve on a particular council. So anywhere from one to 10 years. So looking at something in these shorter time frames allows the council to be much more tactical. And within this project, you know, a lot of focus within the Mid-Atlantic Council 
you know, justifiably so, is thinking about how distribution changes are impacting its own fisheries. But there was also a lot of interest within the Mid-Atlantic Council about what species may be moving into the Mid-Atlantic, particularly from the South Atlantic. And we had already seen some of these changes in regards to blue line tile fish, um, where all of a sudden there was a spike in um, landings of blue line tile fish within the Mid-Atlantic region that was managed by the South Atlantic Council. And so now the both the Mid and South Atlantic Council manage blue line tile fish, and we actually need to work together in regarding science and management issues on an area off of North Carolina where there's some overlap in the assessments and the management process. So this project would allow us to begin to think about additional species that may be moving into the Mid-Atlantic and how we may want to best address those going forward. Slide. slide yeah sorry brandon it, <laughs> that's okay <laughs> it's there but maybe it hasn't uh, propagated to everyone yet not showing up on my screen yet okay it's sorry it'll come eventually there we go <laughs> Okay. Um, so naturally, this project will have, you know, continued, you know, application to our EAFM guidance document as the Council continues to develop and implement the different strategies outlined in the guidance document, this work will, will certainly fit that. One of those specific areas is our, the risk assessment that the Mid-Atlantic Council had done as part of its sort of process to incorporate ecosystem issues within to its management structure and evaluated nearly three dozen different risk elements across um, biological, um, socioeconomic and impacts and that may be affecting all of our different council managed species. So as a way to understand what risks uh, the council was facing across all of its different managed species and how much risk there is. And then they can begin to focus those resources in on those areas of highest risk. And so this um, particular project could, could help in two specific risk factors that the, the council has. Oh, sorry, go back for a second. Do you mind? I think it may take a while, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can so try. On, <laughs> on the previous figure there, there was a table that had all of the, the green and reds and the yellows, and there were two different um, risk elements that may be useful from, you know, that could be informed by this project. One is climate, climate change, and the second is distribution shifts. And if underneath the distribution shifts, you saw there was a lot of red and orange for many of our mid-Atlantic species. And there we go. Uh, so clearly those two, and there's a lot of uh, yellow and orange and red under the climate uh, scenarios. So. So there's a lot of risk associated with Mid-Atlantic Council managed species within these two areas, and this project can help inform those particular areas. Now we can go on to the next slide. It may take a minute. There are now two of us giving webinars right now. <laughs> the downside of everyone working from home. Should we get there eventually? There we go. Um, so here are two other areas of direct application within the Mid-Atlantic system. So the Northeast Fishery Science Center uh, produces a state of the ecosystem report on an annual basis that gets presented to the council. And within the, the state of the ecosystem report, it highlights a number of different ecosystem factors that the council is interested in looking at and certainly distribution changes um, and sort of forecasting what those changes might be looking, looking like is an aspect that could be included. It's already included in some regards in terms of long-term distributions and how those things may be changing. But if we can also provide these short-term forecasts and how that inter, you know, how do that inter relates to many of the other different factors that the state of the ecosystem report provides we can give that information on an annual basis to the council that they can see how the ecosystem is changing on an annual basis. The figure, the table on the right-hand side is, uh, is in regards for how our 
our scientific and statistical committee may use this kind of information. So recently, our SSC approved a sort of structured decision framework in terms of how they were going to account for scientific uncertainty when they're creating the buffer between the overfishing limit and the acceptable biological catch. And they came up with nine different criteria that they were going to evaluate when uh, assigning scientific uncertainty. One of those is ecosystem, ecosystem factors. And so this is set up into three different bins. The bin on the left-hand side is where we have you know, different types of conditions from an ecosystem perspective that they're going to be looking at that would lead to less uncertainty versus those things on the right-hand side that would lead to more uncertainty. And I've highlighted those areas in green where this particular project may provide information on in, in regards to stock productivity and distribution and how things may be changing and what sort of short-term predictions we have available. So develop, depending on what kind of information this project is able to provide, it may provide more or less um, considerations from a scientific uncertainty perspective when the, cap, when the SSC is evaluating how much buffer we need to provide below the overfishing limit. Next slide. Thanks for being patient. Right. Yeah, and then so and lastly, from a specific Mid Atlantic Council perspective, the many of uh, Mid Atlantic fisheries have allocations assigned to them either by sector or by state, and the council is revisiting a lot of those specific uh, allocation decisions right now. And in many situations, they're looking at the potential at dynamic allocation strategies. So what that means is looking at um, where the distribution of the biomass may be within a different within a, within a given time frame, and make allocation adjustments in part based off of you know the distribution of biomass. So clearly, these this work could have potential application to allocation decisions depending on where the council wants to go. If they want to include sort of these dynamic distribution based um, processes as part of the allocation decisions. And so while I think all of those have, you know, those are specific examples to the Mid-Atlantic Council, I think they have application beyond as well. But I think there's a number of examples of where this project would have examples outside the Mid-Atlantic Council along the Atlantic coast and to all of the eight regional councils. One of those is within the stock assessment and projection phase. And so the mid Many stock assessments within the Northeast region are beginning to think about ecosystem issues. They're incorporating ecosystem terms of reference to look at what may be changing productivity and recent recruitment stanzas and, and all of those sorts of things. We're adding more ecosystem scientists to the stock assessment work groups. And so I think this kind of information could be useful as we look at stock assessments and future productivity scenarios and making projections for setting catch limits. We started within the stock assessment process, also adding these ecosystem context for stock advice reports, where it's additional information beyond just what you get out of a stock assessment, what fishing mortality is and what spawning stock biomass may be, but it also gives some information in terms of what might be influencing stock productivity and what might be changing in the environment from prey, um, prey resources to changes in habitat and all of those sorts of things, other considerations that we might want to be thinking about. And clearly this um, work could fit into that. The Mid-Atlantic Council is also right now, it's just you know beginning to formulate a process for considering an East Coast climate change and distribution shift scenario planning project. And so the, the Atlantic Coast has talked about uh, for a long time how we would deal with governance and management issues as a result of changing distribution shifts. But we haven't, we've made some progress in some areas and blue line tile fish being one of them, but I think there's, there's still a lot of work there to go. And so this scenario planning project that is being considered right now is looking at how those management councils and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission could be thinking about um, management and governance situations going forward under future scenarios. And this project could clearly lend itself to that. On the 
sort of national side of things, NOAA Fisheries last year released its climate ready for fisheries management um, technical memo where they discussed talking about the, the science needed to understand and what's driving distributional shifts and then how we translate that information to managers to actually make decisions in regards to understanding and, and dealing with these changes in distribution shifts. So this information could feed directly into that and the Mid-Atlantic Council is um, really interested in sort of taking this climate ready fisheries management process up within its EAFM, you know, guidance document tech, you know, context. And lastly, um, the National Science Coordination Subcommittee, which uh, gets together every other year, all of the uh, SSEs from around the country and the science leadership from National Marine Fisheries Service to talk about um, science issues that all of the SSCs are addressing. We were scheduled to have a, work, a, a workshop this year, but due to the COVID situation, it's both been postponed till 2021. But the workshop themes for, for that meeting include ecosystem indicators within stock assessments, information to support ecosystem-based fisheries management, and then providing fishing level advice for stocks experiencing distribution change. So it's a really timely um, discussion about all of these sort of issues and this project clearly can fit right into sort of the discussion that the all of the different SSCs will be having next year. And so hopefully across the Mid-Atlantic Council and across the nation, we can see how this particular project can, can fit into a lot of different areas that the councils are dealing with. I'll turn it back over to Malin. Great. And we're really excited to be working with you and others at the Mid-Atlantic Council on this, on this project. Um, I just wanted to end by giving everyone a sense for uh, when they can expect to start seeing some results uh, from this project. Um, Alexa and I and others on the team are focused on this year on really developing these dynamic range models for the four focal species that we'd laid out earlier. Uh, in 2021, we'll be focused on evaluating the skill of these models to forecast changes in distribution over one to 10 years. And then 2022 is when we're going to focus on incorporating fishing information into the model structure and uh, testing whether or not the skill improves. And throughout this, we're going to be coordinating with the Mid-Atlantic Council and their, their committees, especially the Ecosystem and Ocean Planning Committee, um, to understand how this information and what, what parts of this information best fit into ongoing management uh, processes, as, as Brandon mentioned. And then as what may be especially interesting to many of the folks listening is that this forecast system uh, we're going to make available at the latest um, in 2022 um, as a, a code base that others can pick up and, and apply elsewhere. Sort of our goal is to make this quite, quite easy and straightforward, likely as an R package available on GitHub so with vignettes walking you through how, how this could be applied elsewhere. Um, please do get in touch. Um, as Emily mentioned earlier, we'd love to hear your comments, thoughts, advice, any of the above. Um, and with that, really excited to take any questions that you might have. Turn this back over to Emily. Thank you. And as I mentioned, folks, as uh, uh, Malin turns it back to me, um, type your questions into the Q&A and I will read them aloud. So here we go. Um, yes, so we have a first question here. Does the model take into account the probability that the various components of marine food webs may be changing and shifting at different rates? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, when we, one of the benefits of moving to dynamic range models is that because they do incorporate uh, demographic processes, it's more natural to, and it's much easier to incorporate those considerations um, you know, and their effect on population growth rates. 
we won't be focusing on that in particular over the next three years. We, we made the strategic decision that focusing on the uh, straight population dynamics and then fishing was uh, more feasible to tackle um, in the timeframe of this particular project. Um, but that would be a very natural extension, especially where there's information on shifting prey availability or predators for that matter. Great. Um, yeah, we have another question here, which isn't really related to this study, but I, I suspect that Malin and Alexa might have something to say about it, which is, is there any study on sea urchin fisheries related to ocean acidification impacts? Uh, to the person that asked this, I can say, yes, there are. There are a variety of studies on biology and reproductive capacity and, and work ongoing. But I figured I would let the uh, scientists weigh in on, on directions you could, you could point this person. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Definitely, as Emily mentioned, there definitely are studies. Um, I don't know any off the top of my head right now. Um, Alexa, are you, can you think of any? Um, I can't think of any on this coast. In the United States, a lot of the research on ocean acidification and invertebrates has been on the West Coast. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and the sea urchin research sort of divided between uh, the sea urchins that are targets of fisheries and the sea urchins that uh, eat kelp and are not our favorite. So the literature is a little complicated, but you're welcome to shoot me an email and I'm happy to help find research papers if, uh, if they haven't appeared yet, feel free to get in touch. Great, thanks guys. And we have questions rolling in, so I'll keep going. And we did get a question about, will the presentation be available? Yes, 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 we are recording this and we'll get a link up on YouTube as soon as we can and we'll be sending that out. So we have another question here. Does the model consider the changes in fish size as a result of climate change and how this can be separated from the potential effect of fishing on size and how that might affect stock assessment? Yeah, also a good question. Um, and similarly, actually to the, uh, the, the previous question, dynamic range models are a much more natural way to incorporate that information. Um, and we may, the, the model structure that uh, Alexa laid out earlier um, may capture at least some of those processes, um, especially for the model forms where we include a temperature effect on growth rates. Uh, if, especially if those effects are already becoming apparent um, or have been apparent over the last few decades, um, we may be able to extract that effect from the uh, from the model fits and also the projections that are made. Um, however, that again is probably a to really dig into that question and really try to separate those two. Maybe a bit beyond what we're going to be able to get to in the in the next couple of years. But the structure we lay out, I think, would be a very natural, and the set of models and tools we lay out would be a very natural way to get at that question um, in a uh, much more natural way um, that fits uh, more smoothly with the stock assessment process. And I think one of the, the benefits of moving to this uh, dynamic range model approach is that uh, it includes the kinds of processes that uh, stock assessments already consider um, and therefore is a more natural fit with the kinds of uh, models that decision makers are used to looking at. And I'll just add one quick note to that specifically related to fish size and climate change, which is that if we find certain species that are doing a very good job of shifting rapidly and staying in approximately the same temperature conditions, we might not expect them to change body size as a result of temperature if the, the you know, the hypothesis is that um, they're in warmer waters and therefore can't, uh, you know, have a physiological limit. So there's a as, as Malin said, a lot of opportunity to tease apart what might be driving changes in fish size, and some of that we'll be able to detect, and some of that someone could eventually build in. Yeah, the, I, maybe one hidden, makes me think of one more thing, which is that the models do include a von Berlanti growth curve, right? Classic growth curve for fish, and we're very explicitly looking at different size classes. So 
again, that's that that kind of information about changes in size will be is something this model is considering. All right, thanks, guys. Um, we have another question. Will the model be able to incorporate physical habitat changes such as artificial reefs? Yeah, um, so the we're developing a, a couple different versions. Um, one that and the, the idea is that there are sort of two classes of uh, variables that affect uh, fish distributions and uh, spatial dynamics. One is a are dynamic variables, things like temperature or, you know, potentially could be oxygen or even prey. Um, and then static variables, uh, which we had been thinking about habitat, but, you know, as, as habitat, things like uh, grain size or bottom type, but you bring up a great point that in some cases, those, uh, those habitat categories can also be dynamic. Um, and so that would be, a very natural kind of consideration to include in these models as well. Great, thanks, Malin. Um, we got another question here. Thank you for the great talk. Really excited about this work. Uh, ABC relies on summary stats of data for defining how you best want your model to match the behavior of. Do you know yet what these are, what these are going to be or what your process will be for defining them. <laughs> yeah, so someone who knows about approximate Bayesian computation. Um, yeah, so the, the variables we've been using so far are gridded annual uh, abundance estimates by length class um, from, the, so from, uh, from the surveys and then matching those against the model outputs with a scaling factor. So uh, there are actually some quite well-established metrics, um, largely actually from the population genetics literature, but increasingly from the computer science world for how to choose the most informative summary statistics. So uh, that our plan is to use some of those methods for uh, narrowing in on the most informative summary statistics for the of dynamics that we're interested in these shifts in distribution. Okay, great. I'm going through these here. Make sure I stay in order. Okay, um, that sounds great, but M FMCs have been very slow to adopt ecosystem-based management, referring to fisheries management councils, uh, much less this sort of advanced planning. How readily do you think the fisheries management councils will adopt and utilize these tools? I guess that one's for me. Um, <laughs> um, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, I don't know for sure. Um, I mean, I, I do think each council is taking its, its um, sort of own own way forward in terms of how to address ecosystem considerations within to its process. And the Mid-Atlantic has taken this very deliberative stepwise approach and in incorporating ecosystem issues within, in, within the single species management. And I think, as I talked about where I think there's potential application of this type of work, I, to me, this is the kind of information that the council needs. This is more short-term sort of understanding about how things are gonna be changing because that's more what they're thinking about when they're making those sorts of management decisions. Now it's gonna add, certainly add more complexity in terms of how they deal with things and it's gonna require more planning and, and thinking about how you would actually implement and utilize this information. But I think this is providing information at time steps and at scales that fisheries management councils need. And so I think there's a greater opportunity to uptake this kind of information um, then some of the other sort of work where it's really just sort of a planning information. And so, uh, you know, I'm really hopeful that this kind of work does lend itself to advances on ecosystem issues within the council process. Cool, thanks, Brandon. Um, so we have a question, how would the data work on data limited 
species like highly migratory species here in the Pacific? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. Um, we, uh, at the moment, we've picked species where there's quite a high, a large amount of data available, um, information on species distributions through time. So, you know, I think we're starting there. I think we have the, the best chance of these models working effectively in that situation. Um, and then another interesting research question sort of a follow up will be how how much data do we need or what kinds of data would be useful. Um, you know, I think to move to more data limited uh, species or especially species where there's just uh, fisheries dependent data that are available. Um, we should be able to do that if we can include sort of an extra uh, process in there, if we consider just the presence only of uh, a aspect of the fisheries dependent data, right? We, if we know a highly migratory species was caught by fisheries in a given location, we know the species was there, maybe there's some information on size classes as well. Um, and if that information is available through time, um, in theory, these models might actually work pretty well um, for those kinds of data sets, but, I, but that I think will be another research question. Um, these are quite data intensive models um, because they need data across space and through time. Um, but even for what we consider data poor species, um, there may be enough. Okay, thank you, great. And I'm also looking over, I'm trying to balance folks are entering questions in the Q&A, which is great, and also the chat. And I, and to those entering questions in the chat, I am paying attention. It's just balancing both sides. So I'm gonna ask a question that was put in the chat. Um, thanks for the great overview. Uh, this is a postdoc working at the University of Bergen in Norway. I am working with mechanistic models that integrate visual encounters and temperature-driven physiology to understand species distributions, and I am excited to see more process-based considerations in species distribution modeling. I am wondering how are species interactions integrated in dynamic range models, and what drivers other than temperature will be considered? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so dynamic range, one of the one of the things I'm especially excited is that including those other processes, predator prey interactions, um, you know, you could, like you were talking about sort of, or it was in the question about larvae and, and fish visual systems and how that affects distributions, those kinds of processes, you know, if you can build a model and simulate that uh, going forward, we can include that or someone else could include it in a dynamic range model. One of the exciting parts to me about using approximate Bayesian computation that Alexa laid out is that it's very, very flexible. We can plug almost any kind of model that we would like into in place or into the structure of the dynamic range model and then compare it against the data. So if we want you know, a very mechanistic model thinking about predator prey interactions and, and visual systems that could be built in. And we could test actually whether that kind of model explains past shifts in distribution better than maybe a, a simpler model. It's a, it's a platform, really is quite a general platform for asking a wide range of questions. Great, thanks, Malin. And we have time for just one more question, but like I said at the beginning, we have captured all of the questions that folks have been asking. So thank you very much, and we'll be providing that to the researchers. A quick note before I ask the question, one of the person put in the, in the Q&A that to the person that was looking for studies on sea urchin and OA, uh, they should check out uh, Theo McKelly and Natalie Lowe at Stanford. They're doing some great work on sea urchins and ocean acidification in California and Baja. So thank you for that tip. Um, and then the last question is, what are the anticipated computer requirements to run the model, also the code, also uh, the code that will be written on what on the platform and software, and this is in reference to what's going to be available on GitHub. Could you say a little bit about that? 
Yeah, um, be happy to. So right now we're running it in Python. So it's a freely available um, scientific prog programming language. And it's running on a personal computer on a laptop um, working quite effectively. So don't foresee this requiring extensive uh, computational machinery. So we're back um, if we learn otherwise. And it will eventually be, as Malin said, open source and available in a GitHub repository, which I'm sure LenFest will help us share once it is closer to prime time. Yes, thank you. Well, we are at the end here. Thank you guys, uh, Malin, Alexa, Brandon. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you to everyone that joined. Uh, like I said, we will be uh, putting the recording up as, as soon as we can and distributing to everybody. Please feel free to follow up with us anytime. Our, our emails are on the screen. But otherwise, have a great rest of your day, and thank you so much. I think we're done. <laughs>